Well, Merry Christmas to you all. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. All right. Yeah, I love it. I'm excited this morning, and I hope you are too. It's good to be back in the pulpit. Uh, I'm excited to get together as we wrap up our Make Room Sermon Series. It's been really a, a privilege for us to have some other preachers come from some different churches and fill the pulpit and preach to us God's Word. Have you enjoyed that? Has that been helpful? Anyone? Yeah? Good, good. I hope you've enjoyed that. It might be something we do again in the future. But I get to close things down this morning with Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 14, a message I'm calling make room for his mercy. So grab your Bible and turn there. If you need a Bible this morning, our ushers will be happy to give you one. They're coming down the aisles. Raise your hand if you'd like a Bible. Uh, we'll give that to you. That'd be our Christmas gift. You can take that home and uh, enjoy that. Or if you just want to borrow it this morning, that is okay as well. But grab a Bible and turn there today. As you do so, let me ask you a question. Any watched any good movies this Christmas season? Anybody, kids, anyone, couple, watched some good movies? No movies? Not at all? You watched one? Awesome. I love it, Colin. That's great. I'm not talking about Christmas movies either. I'm talking about any movie. Anyone watched any movies recently? Okay, a few movie watchers in the room. Good, good. I have to admit, I am not really a connoisseur of movies. In fact, if you ask my family, it is rare that we sit down to watch a movie together where I don't fall asleep on the couch. So... I watch all of these bits and pieces of movies, and when I actually see the whole thing, I'm like, wow, that's how the story goes together. Oh, incredible. But there's a few movies I've made all the way through. Uh, I really like a good action movie. Anyone have seen any Marvel movies? Anyone know what I'm talking about? The Marvel Cinematic Universe, Iron Man, The Avengers, Gal Guardians of the Galaxy. They keep coming off all these movies more and more. Like there's, I looked it up the other day, there's like, gosh, 30 movies or something they've made? It's nuts. But I was reminded recently of one scene in one Avengers movie, Age of Ultron. I didn't think that was the best one they made, but the scene uh, stuck in my mind nonetheless. If you've seen it, you might remember the scene. So all the Avengers are gathered at the Avengers headquarters, Stark Tower, whatever it is, and they're trying to figure out what to do about Ultron. And there is Thor with his hammer. Now, Thor, if you don't know, Thor is the Norse god of thunder. Thor has a special weapon he uses, his hammer. Who knows the name of Thor's hammer? Anybody? Mjolnir. Mjolnir, yes. Nailed it. Yes. And what's special about Mjolnir? Only Thor can wield it, right? He's the only one who can, who can pick it up. What's written on the, on the side of Thor's hammer? Whosoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. And so most of the time, it's only Thor who can pick up this hammer and wield its power. Now, in the scene, the Avengers are all gathered. They're trying to figure out what to do next, and they're enjoying a bit of downtime and kind of teasing each other, and one of the Avengers starts to tease Thor and wonder about, how is it that you can wield this hammer? What's the special trick? What is this some magical thing going on with this hammer? Why can't I pick it up? And so Thor invites all the Avengers to give it a try. It's there on the table, and one by one, they go over and try to lift this hammer. They give it their best attempt, and none of them can pick up the hammer. Even when they pull off all of their superhero strength, the hammer doesn't even begin to budge. And so they have a little bit of a laugh about it, and they give Thor a hard time, and there's many theories as to why they can't pick it up, and then Thor walks over and just sort of grabs it and flips it around and says, I've got a better theory. You all are not worthy. How about you? Would you be able to pick up Thor's hammer? No, probably not, right? Can't pick up Thor's hammer because we are not worthy, right? Now, there's a question in the cinematic Marvel universe about why one would wield Thor's hammer and why one can't and why only Thor and why not Iron Man or Hulk or Hawkeye or even Captain America. What would make one worthy of picking up Thor's hammer? Interesting question. Well, it's not just a question for the world of comic books and cinema. There's a question of worthiness in our own day, in our culture. In fact, it seems to me, in our world dripping with anti-authoritarianism, where the mob of cancel culture seems to rule, there's this concerted effort to show that no one is worthy of anything. When everything's posted online, it's not hard to prove this simple fact. When there's someone we don't like, we can just go dig up dirt on them and prove that they are not worthy of their celebrity, of their office, of their position, of their authority. And so we can fire them, remove them, cancel them, send them back to the dung heap from whence they came. And I think if the COVID pandemic did anything, it made us think of that there's no one in media or government or in leadership who is worthy to be trusted 
or followed. We know for certain that they are not worthy. What about us? What about you? Is anyone worthy? That's the question of our text this morning. Who is worthy among us? It's what comes up in Revelation chapter 5. And what would make one worthy? We're going to see some surprises in our text this morning. As we uncover God's word to us about the, this morning about who is worthy and why they are worthy. And what I hope is that you will consider with me what makes one worthy. Who is worthy? Is anyone worthy? And what I want you to see this morning is that we must worship the one who alone is worthy because of his mercy. So with all of that, let's pray and turn our attention to God's word. And we'll see how we must make room for his mercy because he is worthy. So let's pray this morning. Oh God, as we come to your word now, we ask for your help. It is our desire, God, to make room for your mercy in our hearts and lives. And so would you show us that? Would you show us your great grace and mercy this morning? And God, we long to respond to you who alone is worthy of all blessing and honor and glory, God. And so would you cause us to see you for who you are and what you have done. Cause us to glorify you with all that we are. And God, I ask that you would give us all ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts willing and ready to respond, and help us in the power of your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So who is worthy? That is the question of our text. And here... In Revelation 5, we have the Apostle John in the very throne room of heaven in a spectacular vision. And what does he see? Revelation 5, verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Here's God Almighty the creator, the maker of heaven and earth, and he is seated on his throne in heaven. Chapter four gives us all of the description of what this looked like. And here in chapter five, the creator God in all of his splendor and glory is seated on his throne. And I love that he is seated. God, except for one time, God is always pictured as seated on his throne. That's the image we're reminded of over and over and over again, God seated on the throne. Who sits on a throne? Someone tell me, who sits on a throne? A king, a ruler. For Buddy the Elf, who sits on the throne? Santa in a, on a throne of lies. You smell like beef and cheese, right? Fake Santa sits on a throne of lies, but otherwise, the one who sits on the throne is the one who rules and reigns, the one of power the one of prestige, the one in position of authority, the one who is in charge. Kings, monarchs, emperors, they sit on thrones. And they won't have many of those in our day. The image is not lost on us because presidents and governors sit behind big desks and big chairs. Judges, Supreme Court justices, they sit on elevated platforms. In Congress, the leaders of Congress are high up on these throne-like platforms where they are elevated over everyone else. So the image is not lost on us entirely. The throne shows a position of power and authority and superiority of those who are seated below. And this is the picture of God Almighty. It implies that God is the one who is working all things according to his plan. He rules from his throne in perfect peace and all goes just as he has decreed. We never see God off of his throne, pacing back and forth, pulling out his hair, wringing his hands, saying, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? He's always there seated in perfect power, never panicked, never worried, never fretting, always calmly ruling all things. And I love what Corey Ten Boom once said, there is no panic in heaven. God has no problems, only plans. There are only God's plans in heaven and on earth, and nothing takes him by surprise nor thwarts what he intends to do. So why do we fret so much? Why are we such an anxious people? Maybe it would do us well to remember our God seated on his throne. So John sees God seated on the throne, and he's got something in his hand. It's a scroll. 
It says written on the front and back, sealed with seven seals. The language of the original text here sort of implies that he's got his hand outstretched and the scroll is seated here. He's not clutching it, holding onto it tight. He's, he's got his hand outstretched and the scroll is resting there as if someone is to come and open that scroll. Now, what precisely this scroll is, is sort of a question. There are many theories about it. But if you're familiar with Revelation, you'll know that after this chapter, the scroll becomes opened. And out of the scroll come all of these judgments. Out of the seals come judgments. And out of the seals come the trumpets. Now the trumpets come the seven signs. Now the seven signs come the seven bowls. And after the seven bowls is the depiction of the final battle and its final consummation where heaven is rejoined to earth finally and forever. And so it seems to me the rest of the book of Revelation and therefore the rest of redemptive history comes out of this scroll. And so we could say that this scroll is the testimony of God's plan for all of redemptive history, the final consummation of all things. It's God's plan for justice and judgment, his plan for redemption and restoration. And the image, it seems to me, is of God holding out the scroll waiting for someone worthy to come and open it up and to join him in bringing about the end of all things. And what John sees next seems to further this image. Look at verse two, it'll be on the screen here. John says, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? As if this was destined to happen. God holding out the scroll and awaiting one to come who will open it and break its seals. He's waiting for one who is worthy to join him in bringing about the beginning of the end of all things. And here is John seeing these visions, hearing this loud voice of the angel. And I just imagine John in the throne room of heaven looking around in eager anticipation for the one to come. Who is gonna open the scroll? Who here is gonna come and take the scroll from his hand? He's looking around waiting for maybe, maybe an angel to come or, or one of the beasts that we see there or one of the elders around the throne and he's, he's looking and he's, he's waiting. Who? Who will open the scroll? This is what he's been drawn up into heaven to see. He's looking around and he's, he's waiting and he's watching and he's longing. Surely someone must be worthy. There has to be someone here who can open this scroll and to break its seals. Who is it that is worthy? But to John's great shock and his despair, no one is found worthy. Verses three and four. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Put yourself in the scene. This is what John has been drawn up into heaven to see. These are the visions that he is supposed to tell to the world. He's supposed to see what's in this scroll and who is there to open it? No one is worthy. And to his despair, no one rises up to take this scroll. And John is devastated. He begins to weep loudly. This isn't just the shedding of a tear down his cheek. This is ugly crying. This is the type of crying that you make memes and gifs out of. This is full out weeping. He is, he is wailing. He is lamenting. He is mourning. This is the heartbreak of shattered dreams, of unmet expectations. He is weeping that no one is worthy to open the scroll or to break its seal. And why? Why is there none who are worthy to open the scroll? I mean, there must be a powerful angel, one of the beasts, some other, other heavenly creature who can open the scroll and join God in bringing the beginning of the end of all things. But this is not the role that God has destined for the heavenly beings. It's the role of mankind. Now, I don't want to overstate the case, but it seems to me that part of God's plan for us as his people is that men and women together would rule with God over his creation. See, Adam and Eve were given the task to exercise dominion over all of creation as his image bears. They were to join God ruling as his co-vice regents. 
as overseers and caretakers. It was through humanity that God was to bring about his plan for all things. And something tragic happened to our first parents and to our world. You know how the story goes, right? Look around the world today, we know something deep inside of us knows that it is true. The tragedy of the entrance of sin into the world through Adam and Eve. In the beautiful garden paradise that God had made, something ugly came forth through the rebellion of man. And from that moment onward, we all have been in a state of fallenness, a state of unworthiness, no longer God's co-vice regents. Rather, we live unworthy to open the scroll or to break its seals, unable to partner with God in his plans for all things. And what is worse still, in our sin, in our rebellion, we have aligned ourselves not with God anymore, but with his enemy. Who is worthy? Because of our sin, no one is worthy. Because of this tragic fact, John weeps, and we should too. We should weep over sin and its effects, my friends. Far too often, we take our sin far too lightly. We think it's no big deal. But do we see what it has done? There are not supposed to be tears in heaven. And yet here is John weeping over the effects of sin. And because of sin, John fears that the very plan of God for the consummation of all things will be put in jeopardy. Who now can open the scroll? No one can because of sin. And it's not just sin in general. It's personal sin. It's your sin. It's your lying. Your cheating. It's your lusting. It's your idolatry. Your hatred of your neighbor. It's your sin and mine as well that makes us unworthy. And we, like John, should weep. We should weep over our sin and its effects. We should weep in sadness and weep in fear of the coming judgment of our Lord due to our sin. No one was found worthy. And so John weeps. But if you look at the text, all hope is not lost. For as he is weeping, John hears the voice of one of the elders around the throne. Verse five, and one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll with its seven seals. There's hope, friends. Behold, look and see. There is one who is worthy. Weep no more, John. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has conquered. He and he alone can take the scroll and open its seals. And this here is the language of the Messiah. And the image is potent. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. John hears about a lion who is coming, this lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, a lion has always been a symbol of power, right? Anyone ever been around a lion, like up close and personal? Maybe some of you have. The closest I've ever gotten to a real lion, I think is probably at the zoo, through thick glass, maybe 30 feet away behind a river and a fence and all of that sort of stuff. But we know lions are powerful. Lions are scary. In John's day, if you heard a lion was coming, you wouldn't stand around and watch. You would turn tail and run the other way because this lion was gonna come and eat you. A lion is a powerful thing. We call him king of the jungle. The creatures of power, apex predators at the top of the food chain, male lions especially. All they do all day long is eat, sleep, mate, fight. They rule with power. There's nothing more fierce than a lion. And behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he has conquered. Don't miss that. This one has conquered. He is the victor. He has defeated his enemies. And because of that, he can open the scroll with its seven seals. He is one of power, one of might, one of ability. 
He's one who is worthy to open the scroll. So weep no more, John. Weep no more, Harbor Church. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Here he comes, ready to open the scroll and to break its seals because he has conquered. Now remember, this is what John hears. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. But then he turns and looks. And what does John see? Verse six. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all of the earth. What is John expecting to see? A lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's expecting to see a fierce, powerful, majestic, fearsome lion. And that's what he heard. But the shock as John turns and sees a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Not a lion in power, but a lamb. And what an unexpected sight. So often it is in the kingdom of God that he does things that we do not expect, and yet they are so much better than what we could have thought or hoped or imagined. And this is no ordinary lamb. For though it looks as though it had been slain, this lamb is actually standing amidst the creatures and the elders next to the very throne of God himself. This is no weak, helpless, ordinary lamb. This is a lamb of great power and prominence and prestige. This is a lion-like lamb. This is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and we see his power in a number of ways. We see his power in his position. Where is the lamb? The text tells us he's by the very throne of God himself. He's among the beasts and the elders, surrounded by all of these things. He is the one who is closest to the throne of God. And so simply by his position, we see he's got a place of prominence, authority, and power. We see his power by the description of the lamb. It's meant to show us his, his mighty awesomeness. This lamb has seven horns and seven eyes. Now, seven is the number of perfection and completeness. Horns were a symbol of power. And so seven horns and seven eyes are meant to display the great power of this lamb. He is a lamb of perfect might and perfect sight. He is a lamb not of weakness, but of power. And we see the greatness of the lamb in his posture. This is a beautiful thing worthy of note. When John sees this lamb, what is he doing? He's standing. The lamb is standing. It looks as though it had been slain, but it is not lying down dead. No, this lamb is standing in victory. Now, we're not given an exact description of what this looked like, but I imagine this lamb was probably pretty bloody. The Old Testament sacrificial system was a bloody enterprise. The sacrificial lamb was taken, its throat cut, and the blood drained out as a graphic reminder of the horrors of sin. And so a lamb, looking as though it had been slain, must have been covered in blood in some way. I imagine maybe this beautiful white lamb with red, fur, red wool around its neck and over its chest as its blood was let out. But this bloodied lamb is not lying down dead on the altar. No, he is standing. He has not been defeated by his enemies, not by sin, not by Satan and demons, not even by death itself. No, this lamb has conquered all of his enemies and he has done it through his death. And he's now standing next to the throne of God himself in resurrection, triumph, and victory. This is no ordinary lamb. This is the lion-like lamb, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse, he is the one who has conquered and he alone is worthy to open the scroll and to take its seals, to break its seals and read the contents of this scroll. And this is exactly what we see this lamb doing in the next scene. Verse seven, and he, the lamb, went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. You see, the lamb alone is worthy. This is the one who is worthy to take the scroll and to break its seals. Now question, who is this lamb, this lion-like lamb? Well, we don't have to wonder. It is none other than Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, 
the one whose arrival we have been longing for this whole Advent season. But how do we know that? Well, there's a lot of ways we could prove it, but let me just give you one piece of evidence. Church history tells us that it was the Apostle John who wrote the book of Revelation. And John also wrote a gospel. And very early on in John's gospel is a scene where Jesus goes out into the wilderness to be baptized by John the baptizer, different from the John who wrote the book. It's an incredible scene. It's the introduction of Jesus, who is the main character of the whole gospel story. And as John the baptizer sees Jesus for the first time, what does he say? John chapter one, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is literally the introduction to Jesus in John's gospel. And it tells us so much of what we need to know about this figure, this Jesus. Now, John chapter one, the the beginning is sort of the prologue of the book, but here is act one, scene one. It's like in Star Wars. You know, Star Wars, A New Hope, the first movie, There's this title scroll with all the important information, this iconic opening to the whole franchise. It explains all the important details. And then the camera pans down and we see the Star Destroyer attacking Princess Leia's ship. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Any Star Wars fans here this morning? Some nods? Yeah, good. And then what happens as the the scene comes in and and through the door, who, who comes, who walks through that door? Darth Vader the evil villain. That's the introduction to Darth Vader in the Star Wars saga. And we learn a ton about this character through his introduction. I'm not saying Jesus is Darth Vader, okay? Don't hear me say that. (laughs) Jesus is the hero, not the villain, but the introduction in John's gospel is the same. It has that same effect. John tells us exactly what we need to know about Jesus. Who is Jesus to John? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's not a meek and mild little lamb, not a baby little sheep, easy to be eaten by the wolves. He is a lion-like lamb who gives his life as a sacrifice and who through his death conquers all of his enemies. He is the conquering king who vanquishes every foe. Jesus is the lamb of power and might, of victory and glory, the one who has conquered and the one who alone is worthy to open the scroll and to bring the consummation of all of human history. Is anyone worthy? The answer is a resounding yes. Yes, there is one who is worthy. He, the lamb, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he alone is worthy, worthy to receive all blessing and honor and glory. And this is precisely what happens as the lamb takes the scroll. Look at verses eight through 10 with me. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you've made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So good. As the lamb takes the scroll, all bow down to worship him. And they sing this song to the lamb. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. And why? Pay attention to what they say. They tell us why. Why is he worthy? For you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed a people for God. You see, he alone is worthy because of his victorious mercy. Jesus, the Lamb of God, was slain. And by his blood, he has ransomed a people for God. You see, friends, as we saw earlier on, we, you and I, we are not worthy. We are anything but worthy. In our sin, we have fallen from grace, fallen from the place of partnering with God. We, are, we were at one time to be kings and queens in the kingdom of God, but sin has radically changed that. And now, apart from the blood of Christ, we are captives to the kingdom of darkness. We are enemies of God. 
destined for destruction. And try as we might, there is nothing we can do to rescue ourselves, for we are not worthy. We are like Tony Stark or Bruce Banner or even Steve Rogers trying to pick up Thor's hammer. Even with the assistance of a superhuman Iron Man suit or superhuman strength, the hammer doesn't even begin to budge because we are not worthy. But in God's mercy, he has made a way for our rescue. You see, this is what Jesus accomplished through his death and through his resurrection. Jesus was slain. Jesus was raised so that through faith in his name, we might become a people for God, a kingdom of priests who reign on the earth. And all of this because of God and his great, great mercy. This is who he is, my friends. It's part of his character. In fact, I love that this is the most often repeated thing about God in the entire Bible. Do you know what the most often quoted verse in the Bible, by the Bible is? I hope you know by now because I talk about it all the time. Exodus 34, verses six and seven. This is where God reveals his character to Moses. Verse six of Exodus 34, the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, the Lord of the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. What is the first thing mentioned about God, the thing repeated most often throughout all of the scriptures? God is merciful and gracious. God wants to know of his great mercy and of his great grace. And friends, the greatest display of the mercy and grace of God is the cross of Jesus Christ. It is the entire reason why he came. The entire reason Jesus came into the world, it is the reason for the incarnation so that the Lamb of God could take away the sin of the world by his sacrifice and by his blood. And in giving his life and rising again, Jesus has conquered and he has made us no longer objects of wrath, but instead objects of mercy, a kingdom, priests to our God that we might one day rule on the earth again. Do you see the great mercy of God through the blood of the lamb? Are you worthy of his mercy? No, not a chance. Not a chance are you worthy. But that makes his mercy all the more glorious because the one who alone is worthy has made you worthy by washing you in his blood. He is worthy because of his mercy. And because of this great mercy through the blood of the lamb, we must give him all of the glory. And this is what we see in the rest of the chapter. All glory to God and to the lamb. Because of his mercy, he alone is worthy of all glory and honor and praise. And this is the song of all of creation in the remaining verses of chapter five. Verse 11 and 12. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Joining in the song of the elders and the living creatures are these angels, myriads and myriads, thousands upon thousands this is a countless number. It's like John's way of saying, it's like a million, billion, gazillion times a thousand million, jillion. Whatever you wanna say there, it is the, the most grandiose number that John can think of, some totally nonsensical thing that the mind cannot comprehend, but it communicates the vastness and the greatness of the sight and of the sound. Just think about that sound for a second, friends of myriads upon myriads, thousands upon thousands of angels singing the praises of our king. Lumen Field in Seattle, where the Seahawks play, it holds one of the top spots for the loudest stadiums in the NFL. Some nearly 70,000 fans set a Guinness World Record back in 2013 as one of the loudest crowds ever recorded. Now, sadly, Atlanta currently holds the title. But think about 70,000 people and how loud that must have been as they all roared in, in their praise of the Seahawks. And now think of myriads upon myriads, 10,000 times 10,000 times thousands and thousands more of, of angels singing the praises of God, the, the sound 
of this wall of praise. How amazing that must have been to hear. I'll tell you, one of my favorite things in all of the world is to join with God's people, hundreds and thousands of God's people, to be enveloped in just this wall of praise to our God. There is nothing quite like it. I just imagine John being enveloped by the sound of myriads upon myriads of angels singing, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might, honor and glory and blessing. You see, the lamb alone is worthy because of his mercy. You see, John saw and heard the roar of angels, and then he hears the sound of all of creation joining in the praise of God and the praise of the lamb. He says, and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. This is the only right response to the one who is worthy. All creation joins in this song of worship of God and of the Lamb. Everything God has created, everything in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, all creatures of our God and King lift up their voices and they sing. And they sing the song of heaven. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is our God. Worthy is he of all blessing and honor and glory. He alone is worthy and worthy because of his great mercy. This is what we were made for, friends. Not just to sing, but to fall down and worship the lamb who was slain. To raise our affections toward the one who alone is worthy. To pour out our lives and our love and everything that we are in response to the one who alone is worthy because of his mercy. This is what you and I were made for. To join in the song of heaven and to fall down and worship the lamb who was slain. And what better thing could we do on this Christmas Eve morning? as we consider the mystery and the miracle of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as we see what he has done to ransom us for God, how can we not respond with anything but heartfelt and glorious worship of the Lamb who was slain? You see, Jesus came into the world to demonstrate the great mercy and grace of God. He came in mercy. He came because of our sin, because none of us is worthy. We needed a worthy one to come and to give his life and to redeem us by his blood. And this is exactly what Jesus has done. Who is worthy? The lion-like lamb, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb as though he were slain, standing next to the throne of God. He alone is worthy and worthy of all glory. And so we, we must worship the one who alone is worthy because of his great mercy. And this to me is what it means to make room for his mercy. We make room as we behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the worlds, the lion-like lamb, the lamb who was slain, standing in victory. We make room as we bow down before him in glorious worship and praise. And so this Christmas Eve morning and every morning and every evening and every second of every day, let us worship the one who alone is worthy and make room for his mercy. Let's pray. Oh, good and gracious God, how great you are. Lord, you alone are worthy of all blessing and honor and glory. For you were slain, and by your blood you have ransomed a people for God from every tribe and language and people and tongue. And you've made us, who put our faith in you, a kingdom of priests to our God. And one day, Lord, we will join you in reigning over all the earth again. Great are you, Lord. And God, we know that we are not worthy 
and yet you sent your son, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world to come and die in our place and for our sins. And he went to the cross for us. He died that we might have life and the grave could not hold him. For you raised him up from death in resurrection glory, Lord. And you seated him now at your right hand in the heavens. And we see the lamb who is standing as though he was slain, standing next to your throne. And all the creatures, the elders, the angels of heaven, and all the creation join in giving him and you all glory. And so, God, we say our glory be to you and to the lamb who was slain. And God, help us to join with all of creation in singing your praise for you and you alone are worthy. You alone are worthy because of your great mercy. And so we thank you. We give you our praise. Praise the one who alone is worthy. Praise you, God, our creator. We praise you, Jesus, lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We praise you, Holy Spirit, for dwelling inside of us. And we ask for your help now. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.